morning, everyone. So we think. Ending it. I hope I will do justice in that in the book as well. Most why we're here. So on behalf of the Namibia, welcome everybody. We're looking forward to spending this and to sharing a journey that has been fish um, rot four years on, three and a half years on for the media and the public, but a little bit longer for some of us. Um, just a brief background as to who I am as well. We helped write some of the stories <laughs> in the Namibia that in the Namibian that led to the publication of this book. Um, I have a small role to play Kendall as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to <laughs> Yes, I have a small role to play. I am nervous, yes. <laughs> I am nervous, yes. The bathrooms for housekeeping is out on your right, downstairs on your right again. Um, and I think the coffee and the tea stay outside and then everybody because it's journalists and lawyers in the room, so there's gonna be a lot of I imagine, and that we might all need. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to hand over Sangeni to start. And that may I just ask that everybody introduces themselves when they speak, um, that everybody of who in the room. Sangeni. Literally, really. Rolled by pro. Have this. Uh, Bit of deliberately not a and extra Just Mysterious. State. A significant portion of its fish cells registered in, but not owned by Namibia. This is crucial because very often we are told it's all about Namibianization. Here's Namibianization comes in forms. So. I continue. The most common definition of flag or of definition of ownership, 1%, has little commercial meaning in the complex corporate arrangements that have evolved to ensure that the apparent ownership has little to do with the real ownership of a vessel. The result, as is evident from the summary case, is the loss of millions of US dollars a year in quota fees. It is estimated that Samergy alone leached 144 million, or about 10 Namibian dollars, 
or about 10 million US dollars from Namibia in six years. Samergy is not alone. Other firms, including those from Russia and South Africa, have used the ploy to their advantage. In many ways, the method employed to Namibianize the fisheries fleet should be an object lesson in what happens when otherwise proper and honorable objectives are hijacked by an elite to facilitate foreign investment for their personal benefit. Um, you, you, you would read the book and you would find what flex of convenience really means, but it's, it's, a, it's a formal term, it's a legal term. Prof will explain it uh, perhaps better than me, but it's all about how um, this so-called Namibianization of the fishing industry has been hijacked, been abused, so that people or these uh, uh, foreign owners can claim to be Namibians. I think, Sharon, you have had a big experience with Samari eventually trying to claim that that vessel was yours, but it ended up not being yours. <laughs> um, so for me, I'm reading this uh, extract because for me, it is the essence, it's partly the essence of what we really have experienced, have experienced in this um, fish rod saga. And it's been going on for, for many, many years. So policies being hijacked, uh, by foreign entities with the willing participation of Namibians. Those few Namibians occupying key positions of authority that they were trusted just to benefit themselves. Um, so in essence, the, this book, this project is, is not so much about just a collection of the bits and pieces of stories that you have come across that you have seen. It's especially a top job done by especially Prof um, over a period of in half a year of research, never mind the writing, um, to, to help us understand how these kind of schemes are perpetrated. So it, it really, uh, for me, it's, an, it's a very... Uh, good illustration for anyone who want to understand. Um, we've come in, Chino and I, with a uh, few lines and chapters to make it more palatable. I think that's uh, what we used to, to say to Prof. No, we want the book to be accessible to as many people as possible, many Namibians. So we've come in with our journalistic um, bit to make it more palatable, but in essence, um, the, the, a, a lot of the work is serious academic research, as well as maybe other uh, in-depth analysis, looking to the past, the present, and the future, how, how to prevent this sort of thing. And I think I might not be stretching it to say, um, the, me the methods outlined in this book can probably be replicated or have been replicated in other industries. This is just a microcosm of, of what is happening. Um, the way we ended up as the Namibian getting into this story, the final fish rod story, um, was really, in a, in a sense, accidental. Accidental in the sense that uh, WikiLeaks, Iceland, and the Icelandic news organizations were the first that Johannes Stefansson, the whistleblower, got in contact with, together with Al Jazeera. Um, with, uh, Al Jazeera contacted us maybe three months before the, before the story broke, but what they contacted us with was, will you make space to publish the story? We were quite unhappy about that. We uh, 
managed to get to rope in Sharon to speak with the Icelandics, to speak with Johannes, um, so that they can let us in on the book because after all, we've done this similar work or this kind of work, the leg work of it since 2012, um, if not earlier. Um, but until the last three weeks or so, they wouldn't, they wouldn't budge. Um, but it appears Al Jazeera, or I can actually comfortably say Al Jazeera got cold feet. Um, they pulled out of publishing the, the, at the same time. The, you, you all remember their documentary. Uh, I'm sure many of you think it was the Al Jazeera documentary that got people uh, to resign and arrested. But Al Jazeera's work only came after the elections. That was their uh, reason. They didn't want uh, to, to be accused of having influenced the elections. So they pulled out. And by them pulling out, with the help of Sharon, WikiLeaks, uh, Iceland, and, and Johannes roped us in, giving us very short notice to um, co-publish and, and, and release the material at the same time. So that's how we got involved in this. The book itself is really a brainchild and the sweat of Prof Greenback. And really thank you for initiating it. His point when he came to me was, I want to write a book. I want to give Namibians something to look at and to appreciate how their resources are being fleeced off. This is the first time he said he's seen such uh, body of material proof to see how schemes like this are, are perpetrated. So Tangeni, are you brave enough, are you courageous enough to publish this book? Um, I think I was very naive, just said, yes, of course. Um, didn't quite appreciate that it's, it's going to be a lot of work, even though Prof kept reminding me about it. Um, the Prof was even so, so determined. At one point, um, he had to attend to uh, surgery. Um, uh, this is for me. It, it 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 speaks to his commitment. He had to go in for surgery, so the prof changed his will to ensure that this book gets done. If in case he doesn't wake up from from surgery, thankfully he's here. <laughs> um, that was his show of his commitment. So, in essence, I would just urge any one of you, every one of you, every one of us to go through this material and perhaps we can get the message to our leaders, political leaders, and especially those who are in government able to change policies to appreciate what we need to do. It's not just about fisheries. We're now talking about oil, there's a scramble coming up, oil, and talk of green hydrogen, we could probably use this as a, blue, as a blueprint, how to look after our resources for the sake of all the Namibians, especially the vulnerable ones. Um, I want to use this opportunity to just thank a few people and organizations uh, for the support of this book or the project. People like uh, uh, my fellow journalist, Dileni Mongudi, he's, uh, he's been doing this sort of investigative work for a very long time. Um, so, Fish Road work is part of his DNA. There's Ndangi Kahirika, also a journalist, who have done the initial work that will be seen through this kind of material. Chinovene, thanks a lot. Um, we had uh, lawyer Elise Angula to vet our stories uh, before we published. You can imagine um, how fearful we were about uh, 
how do we get out this explosive information which even the ACC seemingly were afraid to get going with, just set on it. Um, so Elise Angula helped us vet the stories so we could publish with confidence. Um, Konrad Adenauer, Steve Tung, Dennis Leire, um, and your country director, really, really appreciated for helping us, collaborating with us to bring this book to the public. Um, editors who helped us, the UCT press, Johannes himself. I mean, that's, I think um, we probably don't appreciate it for someone to put their life and livelihood on the line to get this sort of information out, um, we, we cannot thank him enough. Sharon, thank you very much. And even for agreeing to, to MC today, but thank you for that background push that you have helped us to get our stories out with confidence. There are a lot, a lot more people. Um, but for all of us sitting here, I really would like to put on record, Shinohona, where are you? Shinongodu helped. Uh, she, she was the effect, de facto project manager. Um, as much as I can claim to be the one signing off things, um, it was she who was dealing with the prof, a whole lot of other people, the editors, Oh, and she is here today. Thank, thank you very much, you know. <laughs> really, really appreciate it. And finally, once more, thank you, Professor. Your baby is delivered. Thank you very much for that, um, Tangeni. Um, and actually, you know, um, just to borrowing from what you have said, I remember saying to Zanele last year, I said, I want to go back to school and do an They asked me why. I said, I want to write a paper on how African countries stolen using fish rot as a case study. And then she said to me, you don't have to do a master's. I can get you a journal. You don't have to do a master's. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want the pressure of a journal. I want to fail at my own cost <laughs> that I'm paying for. But it's true. As a lawyer and one that has done purely commercial law, um, and even a qualification in corporate governance, I have really, I also agree that this fish rot case is what we should use, the blueprint that we should use for the other industries. Because the, the legislation is just designed in such a way that aids looting. You can't do anything about it. And as much as we want to Namibianize and enrich and empower, we're never going to get the type of legislation. So thank you for highlighting that. That is in very, very true. Um, and also, as I said, uh, we started this journey together. I think in as much as Tangeni is thanking everybody and um, me, I also want to thank Tangeni and Shino especially. And you know, that dreadful day of September the 19th, I was sitting right here in a board meeting and I was picked up by 15 police officers, arrested, um, and no one wanted to listen. It was a Friday afternoon. No one wanted to listen wanted that they didn't want to charge me nothing and the only way that I knew maybe that I was going to get that I reached out so I reached out my family and friends also reached out to Shino and, and Tangini so they also really helped to amplify my story and from there the journey of those of us that really were abused in the relationship that we had it was by design maybe whatever reason so also to you you know your your work for all of you and the journalists, everybody else that is, is impactful. Sometimes it saves lives. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so yes, without further ado, I actually want to take this opportunity to announce, I was waiting for the but fuller um, that everybody get here, just so I can notify you that unfortunately, Mr. Fanson will not be speaking um, really because of um, legal advice that he has received. That is, we are too close to trial, unfortunately. Um, and we are scared, all of us, that we'll say stuff that will be used against us. Because at this point, if it's publicly said, 
can be used in court um, when you are cross-examined. So on his behalf and on behalf of, of, of the team here as well, our apologies, but I think we are all here to, to appreciate where we are and the work that has been done and that it's perhaps not the time to, to mess it up right now. So that we can just allow him to join us, I'm sure, but not speak tonight. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ms. Um, Rasman to take over to do the um, remarks on how this development can I'll take my seat. <laughs> Morning hours is better to stand. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Director of Proceeding, Baron, uh, for the opportunity and uh, all the colleagues around me to deliver some uh, opening uh, remarks. Wonderful occasion. Yes, sir. Mr. Tangeni Bandi, a representative of Diplomatic Corps, I do recognize the Deputy Ambassador of the Association here in Namibia, Honorable Anduleni Itula, Honorable Councillor Black, representative from the media, journalist, colleagues, all distinguished guests, a wonderful good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to witness this event collaboration with the uh, Namibian and the University of Cape Town, the launch of the book, Fishrot, Fisheries, Corruption in the Media. In 2019, the media was flooded with breaking news of the corruption on a grand scale, fishing sector in Namibia, which is resulting then the rest of the former two ministers and other high-ranking prominent public figures in government state-owned enterprises and companies. Ladies and gentlemen, since then, almost every week, there's a new chapter about the Fishrod scandal. It has become a very long and complex case and the trial. The Namibian Constitution makes provisions granting the public right to know on how the resources are managed. So the purpose of this publication is first and foremost to serve the public and access them to information and analyzes in a comprehensive manner the form of this book. So not just pieces by pieces, single reports that we recognize almost every week newspaper or in the social media. For the ordinary public, it is not easy to follow every single detail reported in a newspaper, social media, or elsewhere. So it is good to have a book which illustrates the entire scandal and its criminal networks from the beginning, the context at it, is, at it is occurs. Based on the facts, the publics can be better be informed and engage in the matter. And as we heard, a blueprint prevent similar scandals or cases. Ladies and gentlemen, I also want to emphasize today with this book, we also celebrate the freedom of press in Namibia. Namibia is one of the freest press in Africa, has one of the freest press in Africa, highly ranked as number two on the Press Freedom Index in Africa and globally. I'm not mistaken, as number 18. This publication, in my eyes, reflects the country's effort and commitment to ensuring the media practitioners are constitutionally guarantees press freedom and independence. Ladies and gentlemen, we are aware that corruption is nothing else as the abuse of public resources and national assets. As stipulated in Article 100 in Namibia's constitutions, Resources of Namibia belongs to its people. This in particular in a time when Namibia experienced limitation of budget in many areas and a struggling economy after or post-COVID. In a time, ladies and gentlemen, where children go hungry to school, education facilities and hostels falling apart, 
in a time where many areas lack of proper sanitation and housing, where generation years after independence still live in shacks or so-called informal settlements and the youth left behind without jobs. Simply spoken, there will be no sustainable development with corruption and no social justice. And we have seen many of these examples in and outside Namibia. Moving on, I would like to indicate that Konrad Adenauer Foundation does appreciate the efforts of the Namibian government on the fight against corruption so far. However, there is still a long way to go to make sure that the institutions of, the, of state set in place are respected and operating independently, efficiently, and transparent. On the same note, I'd like to state that the institutions such as the um, ACC and corresponding institutions and authorities needs to be strong and well capacitated financially and also with skilled human capital to carry out their mandate. These key institutions need confidence by the public, not only by the public, also by investors locally and internationally, especially when we are looking forward hydrogen and other big projects coming into the country. This also includes mechanism to tackle money laundry. We just heard it in something going on there. Ray listed, for instance, which is often money laundry go, often goes hand in hand with corruption, so we can regard it as brother and sister. What are the difficulties, ladies and gentlemen, in, in combating, combat, combating uh, corruption? It's also based often on some fundamentals in cultural norms. In some cultures, corruption is even seen as a legitimate, as an accepted habit. The systematic corruption, normalization of corruption, and the turning of the blind eye provides a breeding ground for corruption. Nepotism, tenderpreneurship, favoritism, and many similar incidents. For that reason, and in order to combat corruption, it has to start, in my eyes, with civic education. To young people especially, and to establish leadership culture that is based on ethical principles, competency, and compassion. Most important to promote watchdogs of government, such as CSOs, media, and academia. Ladies and gentlemen, corruption is, a, is starting with us as individuals. How are you doing in your daily life? Or when you're approaching public services, for instance? Are we willing to interact and to be guided by principles of justice and fairness? Personal self-reflection, particularly when one is dealing with public resources, is needed and recommendable. Conclusion. Given this perspective, it is exactly why Konrad Adenauer Stiftung or Foundation supports the publication and its dissemination. With regard to our core principles, which are the promoting of democracy, upholding the rule of law, freedom, human rights, and advancing social market economy. It is, in my eyes, our duty, as cast together with the media, the law society, and the academics, and various institutions and authorities in Namibia, to promote ethics of good governance and strengthening public policies and the implementation, putting out corruption. Most likely and unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the fish road mill will not remain as the only case of corruption in the country. This is why awareness and establishing a conscience about the matter in the, so in the society is essential to prevent the unlawful misuse of resources. We are all well advised to be better invest the resources in our youth for the prosperity and economic growth of the country, instead of for the benefit and self-enrichment of single individuals, their friends, relatives, or clientele. Let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by stating that corruption is destructive to economy, 
democracy and rule of law. In the final words, I would like to thank all the people and all the colleagues and partners gathering here today, particularly the entire team and authors who worked hard on this book. Thank you for taking time, ladies and gentlemen, in your busy schedule to attend this book launch. I'm very confident that through this publication and also through other CAS activities, just to mention a few it's in the radio program, Root Out Corruption, um, which is broadcast, I think, weekly. And many other activities and programs and workshops, we will be able to tackle corruption and understand the loopholes in the system and how to prevent them. Us will for sure continue to support all the institutions which are promoting democracy, ethical leadership for the greater bait of the country and its population. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you very much for those wise words. Um, I must say yet again, on the other side of the Fisher Art scandal, every word that I hear um, that people are saying when it comes to governance tends to have a more, more impact on me, I think, than, than any ordinary person hearing it because I, I still live it. I live it every day. I have, um, I have 27 fishermen sit without a job and they call me every day to ask me for, to ask me for bread. So I'm still, still living it. Thank you very much for your contribution and for your investment as well. So with that said, I'm going to move over to the man of the moment, as per Tangeni's words. But before you start, Prof, I just want to warn you, I am looking for a ghostwriter for my book also. <laughs> uh, but yes, with that, uh, let me hand over to Prof to um, give us a, a contribution on long-term impact and sustainability on the, on, uh, um, from the book. Friends, uh, colleagues, and those who I hope will become friends, thank you very much for attending. Um, first, uh, thanks. Thanks go to the Namibian uh, for um, publishing this along uh, with the University of uh, Cape Town uh, Press, which uh, have agreed to jointly publish this. This is a peer-reviewed book. This isn't uh, simply a, a, a journalistic work. Um, it's been peer-reviewed. It's been fact-checked. That's probably the reason why it's taken so long uh, to get into press. It was probably ready last year. These things are absolutely necessary. Let me also, again, thank... Uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, which has provided vital assistance to the publication and printing of this book, would not uh, have been easy or possible without them. Now, I want to turn to individuals. Uh, and I don't want to get soppy about this, but let me thank my colleagues and co-authors, Shinoveni and Tangeni, uh, whose work for the Namibian, work for the Nam Namibian newspapers. These are brave people. Uh, who stand up on a daily basis, speak their truth to power, uh, and suffer all the risks attendant to this activity. These are the real Namibian uh, heroes of the post-independent struggle for freedom and the rights of citizens. However, the greatest uh, thanks has to go uh, to somebody I've never actually met, uh, which is Johannes uh, Stephenson, who I've been in touch with over the space of two years in the preparation of this book, and as he himself has gone over it. Um, now, this is a man who has risked his life uh, uh, to do what he did. Uh, and that really takes much more courage than I have. But uh, we'll get to that later. Um, 
he, he disclosed vital information about the misconduct, the alleged misconduct and alleged malfeasance, corruption of his employer. And uh, he has suffered for it. And uh, all I can say is uh, I stand with him. Um, he's been uh, an exceptional uh, guiding light for me. I've seen so many people do this because, unfortunately, my own career um, has been in resource economics. Um, uh, I have written books on diamonds, many of them gold, fish, um, logging. Uh, and guess what? Every time I pick up a stone, I look at a new industry, there's filth underneath. And any honest person who looks at these industries uh, will find that filth. There are other people who are called resource economists who don't look at that filth, but I do. And without shame uh, at all, because I don't believe an honest economist can look at what happens in the resource sector uh, in Africa and around the world without um, considering malfeasance, which isn't um, exceptional. Uh, I've been involved in also in international trade all of my life, and what we've seen some Herji do is daily business practice. It isn't exceptional. Nothing about what we see in fish rot in terms of the business activity is in any way exceptional. This is the way business is done. Say what you want about your entrepreneurial heroes, but the reality is in the resource sector, which I know pretty well, there are some nasty characters. Okay, now, um, I want to say a couple of nice things about Namibia. Namibia is a great place. I really like this country. I'm very fond of it. And I'm very fond of it for two reasons, all right, as a policy analyst. The first reason is you've got two cabinet ministers sitting in prison for three years. Now, how exceptional is that anywhere in the world, let alone in Africa? And they're sitting in prison for corruption, for money laundering, all right? And they're sitting there on remand, of course, but that's wonderful. Namibia should be proud of yourself that that's the case, because I can assure you, in most of the countries that I've worked in in Africa, that would never happen. A cabinet minister only goes to jail when there's a coup, right? Not because he's robbed his people, okay? I know it's nasty to say that, but that's regrettably... Actually, in Mozambique, we have a case as well, a fish rot, with a similar um, situation. Now, the second thing I'd like to say about Namibia, which is really positive, is I am here. If I had written a similar book on a similar subject in Kenya or Nigeria or South Africa, and I'll even say so, even in neighboring democratic Botswana, I doubt I would have even gotten to finish the book, let alone to have the temerity to return to the country and launch the book, because certainly I would have ended up, um, as one of my friends put it, with uh, a, a horse mackerel in my mouth and a 42 in the back of my head in, an, in, a, in a shallow ditch. Right? Only in Namibia would have I considered coming back, because you do have rights. Please protect them jealously, right? because they are fragile. They can be taken away, and they will if citizens don't um, act protect them. Now, let me tell you something. I wrote this book, and I have not made one dollar. So if anybody thinks I'm here, the money, wrong. Not all white people are here to make money, all right? That's just not the case. I actually lost money, all right? And I'm very proud of the fact that I lost money. I paid researchers uh, to help me with this, and that money came out of my own pocket. And I did, we did get assistance uh, from, from uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, but we still had to pay a, a great deal of, we, I had to pay 
a great deal of money. And I do this for only one reason, which is, I say in the text, why did on earth would anybody be so foolish as to lose money on a book? Well, if you know anything about publication in Namibia, nobody ever makes money out of publishing. It's just not profitable. But leaving that entirely aside, um, I did this for your children. Because I don't believe you really care. Your children might. And let me say something that you're not going to. This is not a nice story. The not so nice part of this is this man has been publishing stories about corruption in the fisheries, along with him, for 10 years. 10 years. I even published stories long before fish rot. Nobody cares. Now, let me tell you, explain to you this very simple reason why. Because when I talk about fish rot to taxi drivers, the response is, how do I get into it? I want to eat, all right? And when your children finally realize that they can't eat because everything that can be has been stolen by a corrupt political elite, it's only then that what I've done makes any sense. Okay? I don't believe that anything will change in Namibia from this book. Not a thing. Only when the people of Namibia demand vocally change to the way in which they are governed, things get better here. Okay, that's all there is to say about that. Now, I want to say something about a nominally a nominal Namibian Spaniard. Right? Uh, he was runs a very large um, hake fishery uh, in Luderitz, and he is definitely Namibian. And one of the chapters in the book, I just want to show you one picture. Forgive me for doing this. It's this. It's on page 65 if you've got the book already. This is what the colonialists did to Namibia before it became Namibia. In 1968, the Spanish, the Soviets, our comrades, all right, and the South Africans took three and a half million tons of fish out of our EEZ. And that absolutely devastated the fisheries, and it has never recovered has never recovered from what I call the great colonial pillage. I mean, the chaps who are sitting in prison, yes, they may be scoundrels, but they're small scoundrels in comparison to what was done to us before we had a nation state. Okay? But don't worry, the ones who will follow will certainly learn their lesson. Okay, I said that because a Spanish chap said to me, he said, why are you repeating this story? Everybody in Namibia knows this. And it's not true. The number of people I spoke to about what happened to Namibia or inside the Namibian EEZ before independence, none of them had a clue of what was going on. No, but it's, it's not a story that's known. And I'm glad I've documented it. I'm sorry I bored you. All right? But it's important that you know there is a history. And I, the consequences of this is what? How many people work in the fishery? If they hadn't pillaged us, twice as many Namibians would be working in the fishery as they are now. Because there just aren't enough fish. And there will be even less and less. Now, I've, I've gone off my speech. I'm, I'm very bad that way, so forgive me. Okay. Now, the, the robbery and plunder of Namibia's marine resource in both the post- and pre-independence period is now a matter of public record. Some of the beneficiaries of corruption are in the dock. History will judge whether anything has been learned from the sad affair. I fear, though, that history will not judge Namibia innocent of crimes against resources that properly belong to future generations. These fish belong to your children. Right? You kill them all now, there isn't going to be anything for them to eat and export. That's what's happening. I can guarantee you that your stocks are in rapid decline. What I can see, mind you, the Ministry of Fisheries is so secretive, I think they must have taken lessons from the KGB. You can, I got no information whatsoever, no cooperation, no assistance. They haven't publicly issued 
um, a, uh, a, an annual report since 2012. You have to ask for it, and you won't. I, I certainly wouldn't get it. Okay. Now, I want to talk about how much is lost in all of this. If we, we had an argument uh, in London um, uh, over this, I'm not ashamed of the argument. What happens is, this is considered Nam Namibian empowerment. Fish are sold at a nominal price to Namibian, uh, um, n nominally Namibian fishermen, fishing companies, and then they on sell them and make massive profits to, uh, they, they on sell them to the foreign fishing companies. Now, I actually use the numbers that Yo Johannes Stephenson gave me on what the price is that they sell those fish at to the foreign companies. Okay? And I calculated that if we had actually sold them, we had cut out the Namibian middleman, how much would the people of Namibia who own this resource actually be better off. And the figure is 14 billion Namibian dollars over a period of 10 years. That's just from horse mackerel. I don't have the numbers to do a similar analysis for the other species, some of which are much more valuable than horse mackerel. And I have, and I th have Dudley to thank for his brilliant cartoons, but he's got a cartoon in here, and there's, um, there's this Mercedes-Benz sitting outside a Kambashu, uh, in Katatura, and it's got a, a party flag on it. We won't name anybody. Um, and one guy says to the driver, says, you know, comrade, we could have completely rebuilt Katatura with that money. He says, yeah, but then you would have been riding a bicycle, all right? Not a Mercedes Benz. Um, and that's exactly true. If we had, over a period of 10 years, taken the 14 billion Namibian dollars that should have accrued to the Namibian fiscus from selling those fish at a proper price to the actual companies that fish them, we would have had enough money to demolish every Kambashu and Tura. Yes, and build the equivalent of RDF housing with electricity and water for 14 billion. Yeah, that's the price you paid for this corruption, to create a Namibian fisheries elite. And it's not even an elite. Some people just make millions of dollars. Uh, they buy the quota, sell it. I have a list of the names of all of the people in parliament who benefited from this. Right? It's official. It's not it's what parliament publishes. Uh, Tangeni published this. Nobody cares. Don't care. And this list of 22-odd MPs, doesn't include their wives, or their children, or their relatives who own quota, right? The entire political elite, in my estimation, is very much involved in this whole matter. And that's why it won't change. That's why it won't change, you see. Namibians are smart people. They're not stupid at all. They know exactly what's going on here, right? They know exactly, and they don't have any excuse that they don't have the resources to solve the problem of poverty, the problem of hundreds of thousands of Namibians living in Kambashu when they could be living in decent houses. They can solve that. They just don't want to. They don't care. The problem's not here, and the problem's not there. The problem's here. They didn't either have the heart for the poor, all right, nor the will to do what's needed to end the worst and ugliest aspect of apartheid and colonialism. It can be ended. You just don't want it. Why? Because you need to buy your own elite. Not nice, am I? It's all right. Okay. That's enough of that. I've been nasty enough. But it's going to get a bit nastier for a couple of more minutes than then they can put a uh, horse mackerel in my mouth.
when, when, I, when I came here, my friend said, you're, you're, Roman, you're, you're courting with death, going back to a, an African country when, to tell them about corruption in their own country. I, I, nuts. And I said, well, it's, at my age, it's about the only courtship that is going to be successful. Um, and, um, <laughs> uh, and I won't die young. And third, you don't understand Namibia. That's the most important argument. I don't actually think I'm going to end up with a horse mackerel stuck in my mouth in the bottom of a, of a pit, because I wouldn't have come here if I did believe that. Fortunately, Namibia still isn't there yet, but there's no guarantee, unless you protect your democracy, unless you cherish it greatly. OK, long-term sustainability. I'm apologizing for boring you to I have two long-term sustainability um, that uh, I want to address. The first is transfer price manipulation. How do you think somehow you got this money out of the country? It got it out of the country by um, underpricing its fish, overpricing the vessels, cheating local owners. Uh, it, it's nothing. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 70 and I've been doing this stuff in fisheries and logging and mining and petroleum for 40 years and that's the story. Normal business practice. So how do we, what's the conditio sine qua non, the minimum condition needed to be able to do that is secrecy. As long as the secrecy jurisdictions, the ones like Mauritius, right, and Seychelles and Dubai continue to exist, have a chance of ever taxing these people properly. Right? Not a chance on God's earth. So I've got a solution to this. Right? Some, but you're not going to do this one either because it takes, if, if it takes political will to be able to resolve the issue of the Kambashus, this is even more difficult. But there is a solution. For every problem, there's a solution. The question is whether you're willing to pay the price. Okay, so how do we stop this? Now, I, I've, I've written three books on diamonds. And um, it's people, my mother wouldn't invite them to dinner. That's, that's a polite way of what I'd say about most diamantaire trade in diamonds. They are scoundrels. They do not pay their taxes. They are bad people. So how do you stop them? Now, uh, two economies which uh, have a significant presence of diamantaire, uh, which are Belgium, because of the market in Antwerp, and Israel, which has a very significant number there as well, have said, well, chaps, when you come with your tax returns to the tax office every year, and every year you tell us you're not making any money, we don't believe you. So what we're going to do is we're going to send you a bill. It's called a forfait in French. Every year, you will get a tax bill from us, not from what you lie to us when you fill in your tax form. Any accountant can cheat. We're going to send you a bill based upon the revenue that we think you've generated, all right? and you will pay to us a percentage of that okay, uh, every year. And if you don't like it, shut down and go away. And they pay. Now, what Belgium and Israel can do with diamonds, you can't do. Try doing that in Namibia. Nobody will invest because that will be saying to them, you invest, we'll send you a tax bill, and you don't know what it is. So there's no way that can work here. But there are countries that There is another way. which is also politically difficult. Nothing is simple in this. The key to getting your money out of the country is to have a tax haven. Ask any of the chaps sitting in prison right, right now for fish rot. They all use Dubai. Dubai is fabulous. Want to get your money out of the country. Right? It's secret. It barely, it, only, it nominally cooperates with Interpol, nominally. Right? But uh, really, Problem is us. What should happen? If I earn interest in Namibia and I am a foreigner, I am taxed on that. 
withholding tax if I take it abroad, okay? Because that's treated as income, right? It's called withholding tax. If I own a dividend and I'm a foreigner, I pay a dividend withholding tax, right? That's the way we need to treat all transactions with every secrecy jurisdiction. If you are trading with the secrecy jurisdiction, all right, with a company that is passive, i.e. doesn't have any real presence, you must pay a tax based on that transaction, all right, which is equivalent uh, of, say, 10 or 15%, as is so common throughout the world, because we deem what you've done as income. It's not purchasing insurance from Mauritius. This is your income that you are transferring to a, a shelf company in Mauritius. Uh, that, the, the problem with this is as follows. First, there's no such thing as a tax you can't evade. Right? You could nominally evade this by doing it through a country which you do not list as a secrecy jurisdiction. But the real problem is political. The problem are the secrecy jurisdictions. Well, they're all part of the EU and the US, all right? And let me just pick on one of them, right? Switzerland. You know Switzerland? It's one of our biggest trading partners in one year when I was teaching at UNAM. Copper was being sold into in Switzerland, our copper. But Switzerland reported that no copper was ever imported from, from uh, Namibia. So what was happening? Well, obviously what was happening somebody was using Switzerland as a tax haven to avoid paying any, evade paying taxes here in this country. And as long as uh, the same thing was happening with vessels bought in the Bahamas, right? There's no trade between the Bahamas and Namibia. Ask the Bahamas. And these are some of our biggest trading partners. These are just intermediaries, secrecy jurisdictions that are used to avoid paying tax here in Namibia. Now, um, the real problem with this isn't just the imposition of a tax on a transaction with a passive company in a secrecy jurisdiction. The real problem with this is Joe Biden. Joe Biden. He's from Delaware. Anybody know Delaware? This is the slinkiest, dirtiest little state in the American Union when it comes to being a secrecy jurisdiction. But it has followers, New Jersey, Nevada, Wyoming, all of them are as bad as any of those terrible little islands in the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, uh, and in the Caribbean. They are the problem. Switzerland, Luxembourg, sorry, they're part of the EU. Can't blacklist them, can we? God knows what would happen to us if we suddenly said any transaction with Switzerland, with a passive company, we are going to impose a withholding tax on you, right? Because we presume it to be income. Right? That's it. No more questions asked. And I can, I can only begin to imagine what the pressure would be on an American government for trying such a thing. And the list goes on and on and on. But the problem is, problems are solvable whether you have the wills. I've been going on, haven't I? One last one. My sequel. If oil rot was fun, it wasn't, believe me. All right. Then my sequel to this book, which I will be long dead and when it's written, will be oil rot. All right. Because uh, what we've seen stolen here is absolute peanuts in comparison to what will be stolen when three billion barrels of oil hit the economy. And don't wait for them to be pumped out of the ground for the corruption to begin. Because if we know anything from the experience in Mozambique, there is what's called the pre-source curse. Everybody has heard about the resource. This is the pre-source. The pre-source curse means that before um, uh, the stuff hits the, hits the economy, you go out and borrow money like crazy, and you end up giving tenders to all of your friends, and they make a fortune, and they give you backs, and you get power again. That's the way it works. 
and the money is gone before you get any oil? Ask the Mozambicans. That's what they're going through now. Okay, there's a way to stop that. There's a way to stop that, gentlemen. Let me tell you what it is. Ten years ago, I wrote an article. Ten years ago, I wrote an article when I said that there was oil going to be coming out of the ground. I wrote an article in Namibia, Nigeria, or Norway. All right, that's your choice. And right now, after fish rod, I think Nigeria. All right, not Norway. But whether it is Nigeria or Norway, it depends on you. Nigeria, there. I lived in London for several years, and all of my rich neighbours were were. Nigerian had made vast fortunes from the oil industry and from tenders that came from it. Uh, you can stop this. You can stop this because you can follow the uh, Norwegian. Take all the oil revenue uh, that's going to come, put it into an offshore trust fund. Because if you don't, first of all, the Namibian dollar will appreciate much. You allow it to. Right? Um, your corruption will become much worse. Take the money offshore, you can finally take that money and dedicate it to those who can't sit in this. That's what the Norwegians have done. They created an offshore fund. It's managed completely transparently, not like your ministry. Right? And know exactly where that money is going. And uh, if you don't take it offshore, the impact uh, will be such that you will really not like the, the maybe children will, because it will be. But there are solutions. There are solutions to the problem of poverty. It's in your hands. Your hands to change it. Only when the people of Namibia demand change, not me writing books, when the people of Namibia demand change. They have to demand change in very large numbers for the plunderers and robbers uh, who have been in power uh, go elsewhere. Thank you very much. Time, I'm sorry if I've... No, I'm not sorry if I've... Uh, no apologies. Let truth be told, even if it's mine. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, also, it wasn't an argument, it was an exchange of words in London that we had. <laughs> but thank you, Prof, for, for your words. And um, I usually say on social media, I tell everybody, I say the only people that are going to save this country, Gen Z, the kids. And every time something happens, I put it up on social media and I said, once again, the children are cleaning up Namibia because they are the ones that are marching. Not even my generation, not the millennials, it's the Gen Z, the kids. Those kids are cleaning up this country. And, and we, we, we have an experience, we just saw it. Oh, sorry, Gen Z, the <laughs> Generation Z. So we, we see it with kids. They, the kids are cleaning up this country. And hopefully, the time is going to come. Hopefully, what happened on Independence Day is the reason why. So thank you, Prof, for that and for reminding us that we do need to demand change and hopefully that we have to save our children um, one way or the other and that it, it, a child in Karatura should get a chance to sit at any table they deserve um, and not be blocked because they don't have the correct learning, for example. So with that said, I'm going to introduce Shinoveni, my favorite person. Every single day, I see something in the newspaper that has anything to do with fish rot. I sent you know, a, news, uh, a text, and I said, did you write about me? Am I going to read about myself? <laughs> like, you know, why, did you hate, why do you hate me? But like I said, Shinoveni was really a um, good friend to me. I was going absolute most through the hardships of the fish rot as well. Very understanding, um, very demanding and taxing. Um, the calls at night, I don't understand, this, explain what is TAC versus this. She know, when I do, send me a voice note rather, Sharon. She, it means this, no, but it comes with a very, very dedicated young man, so, and has become a friend um, in this, um, on this journey that we are on, and very deserving that you should be sitting here. Really did do a lot of the work, so let me 
allow you to say your words, but with that, I really want to give you flowers while you like to say you deserve them. <laughs> yeah. Um, often, um, often I, I, I prefer just have make up their mind. But I just wanted to quickly just add to by the prof about, uh, about the issue. Remember in 2018, the Namibian ran a story, as I go to the chat. Um, it was 2018 and the government, I don't think people were disgusted in uh, the point. I just bring up that example to say that years later, Darium actually realistic. I don't think next generation might ever taste it. So I bring that up to say that Osmegral, which was handled that to going down. I remember talking to Prof, he went to the post while he was there. Came back so disgusted. And so actually, even the people who are fishing there right now, like the horse mackerel has come from this size, smaller. That means I think technically, maybe I don't know how many years we have to save. But uh, just wanted to bring that up to emphasize more. Uh, my role mainly is to just give uh, largely a perspective how we start covering entity start. Um, uh, just for my few notes that I did here, I see here that um, around 2012, 2013, uh, that was, uh, I was like years into. I did a story around the scramble of fishing among companies. Russia, China, and so at that point, that was really the scramble of countries, countries scrambling for after that was a year after. So probably some of these companies will then later on team up with Samergy uh, to then form the way they were set up is government. Uh, compelled every joint venture of companies, five companies, came up with an internet company that will then sell support. So that is, uh, in my view, anecdote of how it all started and how it was done wrong. So by 2014, um, the Namibian publishes for the uh, questionable appointment of James James Atwiku on the board. Uh, my colleague Ndangi Kahurika did um, so at that point why often I say when we did worry about um, an appointment of the board member, an appointment of executive director, you should always look because often in terms of power and uh, the source allocations where power players of chess move. So around 2014, we did a story around that. Uh, it was it was really, I think, not as high key as probably should have. But I think at that point, it, I think James himself was was, uh, was um, unhappy about that story. He then threatened to sue us later, a year later, after another story. So around 2015, Gengop uh, retained Esau as the Sheriff's Minister. Now. So crucial to understand Esau's role in this. He was appointed in 2011, but by 2011, I think he found the was either already process or almost done in terms of application of really have a lot of power in terms of determining who gets what because by then was already the system was already structured for him. Is why you later see that the short accused came up with the Angolan donation just. The, the, this current pot of fish that's already designed for like 10 years 
was already done. Um, not to say that he was not powerful, but it's just that uh, he didn't have much power at that point. But in 2015, uh, President Gengob retains SOS as Fisheries Minister. Uh, that cabinet uh, appointment, um, he, one appointment was one appointment was not made as the attorney. Um, my understanding is the issues around whether she will appoint Saki or not. I remember meeting down the day of the appointment, I think, Daniel, and felt like, uh, I think he felt like a uh, let down, like uh, he has, he has uh, done a lot of work and supported gang up, so he felt, I think, disappointed. So I think few few weeks later, two weeks later, Changala was appointed as Attorney General. I wrote that story and um, I provided a bit of context to say this man who is appointed in this position but uh, I didn't say it, but I, I gave hints to that. And obviously some people felt I'm going after Saki, young men, we were crying for young people in positions, why are we you know, being negative about Shangala, right? So, so the context of Shangala was that he then became the crucial architect of law reforms in terms of structuring the fish rod scheme uh, later in the year. Uh, that is key, especially after, so 2015, that same year he was appointed, he, they, they started with especially changing the law. I remember I was covering parliament at that time. Um, frankly, when amendments were brought to parliament, I didn't really have appreciation of what was going on. What There was this amendment to the rights, the way they sold it, it was actually, it was to give the government more rights into, more power into some resources. But uh, I think two weeks later, we then reported the story titled uh, Law Gets Smelly. Subhead was something around, uh, some, as I was saying, Tarashaniga by Puppet or something. Uh, context is that is Tarashaniga came from, comes, was the chair, was the presenting the yeah, Chamber of Commerce. Other people were questioning the ministers. Uh, amendments that were tabled in Parliament. So that story, I um, don't think it got a lot of uh, feedback, but they, at least what I like about that process is people in the background, the counter, accountable institutions, lawyers, all of them were pushing government to recheck that, those amendments. Those were the amendments that were made to the more powers. So that same week, um, uh, the, the, we did an editorial. Often we do editorial Friday, and it's all, often written by Tangeni. And the, that's uh, Sweetie Pai Jeans, Angas. She's an unsung hero. I'll, I'll, I'll explain later. Okay. Uh, so the editorial said, um, "SAO should embrace transparency and not hypocrisy." Just pushed, pull out, I pulled out a quote here. It says, SO seems to have decided that if he cannot beat the law, court that is, then he will have, have it changed. Um, that was an editorial in 2015, right? In that same year, while we were doing these stories, we also had to appreciate sometimes even calling the bad people or the people who are trying to do the bad thing. Also deserve the voice, even if know that they are lying actually. And uh, one of the one of their narrative was that actually they are trying to source a company that has a lot of money for years. But that company is called BD. So I remember talking to Saki at some point and they they they, they Saki Shangala and they made a presentation to Parliament of National Council explaining why they the law needs to be changed. So they give out some figures. It's uh, one of them, it says Big Bidvest made 1.2 billion from it. Right? So our headline was something around Best Pockets 1.2. Uh, then uh, just uh, around end of December, I think we did another story about uh, another TBN official, negative, was uh, handpicked by SO to serve on the Fish Corps. Uh, we felt at the point that uh, you, 
the, the process was, get, was getting a bit muddy now where they, they are, because Fishco owed DPN and they will want to that person basically do some dirty work for them. So we reported on that story about DPN tangled who was appointed on the Fishco board. Later on that was revoked. But within that story, we did mention had we could control again this thing. That was around 2015. That's when he then dispatched the letter as to threaten to sue us. He said, Man of honor cannot be blamed you know, for if the minister feels capacity. Um, often, often we are very reasonable. Uh, often when we know that you are up to no good, we even give you a benefit of a doubt. But when you are, when you see that you are bluffing, really, we'll, we'll decide to be stubborn as well. So in case, in, instead of responding to James. Often we'll respond to him or we'll correct or we'll say, okay, let's meet up, let's find a way to find a solution. We, in this case, we didn't even bother to respond. <laughs> I think even Tangeni is the one who pushed us to say, look, let's just write that he's threatening to school. We had a story says people will be threatened to school. Uh, in 2016, now, um, after, I remember, I was just explaining the parliamentary, uh, the parliamentary presentations that. That uh, bid that uh, J, uh, that Sh Saki Esau were making national council basically pushing that the law be changed so that they can have more powers. Uh, in 2016, there was a serious pushback, and this pushback was mainly mainly through Amsov, which is owned by West. Uh, I think one of the headlines I did was Shangala Esau wants Amsov apology. At that point, I think they felt confident. Actually, they've now got, gained uh, confidence in uh, terms of law passing. So they say, okay, now you should be able to. Apply. I think one of the terms of it, signed later on. Um, now, 2016 was, yeah, was, it, had, it was a lot of work. But remember, we didn't really just focus on fish. Because I think, I remember, it's either 2016, SME Bank Fake. I'm dear of those stories I had to do. So we, in this case, we a bit of focus as well on. Um, in 2017, that was a crucial year. Right. Just a bit more wisdom. Um, this was uh, when, this was a swap of Congress year. So often when you have fights within faction, that they always let it slip, but they are up to what they are picking. So uh, picked up, I picked up from various sources how Fishco was contaminating the fishing sector by squeezing out smaller, smaller fishing companies. So uh, around uh, 2017, some sources, uh, guys who companies that fishing for years, but because Fishco was getting government, they were making the price cheaper on the ground, and smaller companies were either shutting down or just couldn't. So this guy. One of these source promised me, said, oh, I'll, I'll give you a short write, write down to explain what is happening. But one of the th serious issues, um, Ishko is already a big brother, he's already a company. It, has, it was squeezing out a lot of companies, a lot of, uh, a lot of smaller companies. Um, I don't think we did that story here later. But uh, that same, to uh, some, uh, that, uh, at that same point, I think closer to the Swapo Congress, uh, it has was involved in this, which was a person told me like, look, they, uh, this fishing thing, a lot of money being paid from to an extent that I think the example of how bags of money were commonly, right? Then uh, I, okay, we, that story, but it gives us more, say actually there's more here, in the story, or at least try and do a story, but uh, at least um, there's some uh, serious issues there. So uh, later on, um, uh, I, I okay. Um, April, yeah, around 2018, Now, 2018, this is where we literally started uh, realizing that. So that was 2018. 2018, we wrote a story titled Esau Spoon Feeds Fishcon. 
that remember that was after I also spoke from the sources that all our companies were spread out. But one of the reasons is because SO literally signed an agreement, a secretive agreement, give fish core fish worth 1.8 billion over 15 years. Um, uh, this story, we, uh, uh, we hadn't appreciated the full context of it, but I know I, Tangeni was at Harvard at that point for, for his studies. I know that I had sent him the that proved well, just to make sure that we are clear in our message. And I think the, the message should have been clear already by then. Uh, but I think the prof is right to say sometimes we don't get trusted enough because here we have a whole handling state owned fishing company, free fish, and we don't know how it will be held accountable. So uh, in the in in May, uh, because by then uh, May 2018, I was we were picking up. Okay, actually, SO will be a man in trouble. So I wrote a story called uh, "President Questions SO on Corruption Allegations." That was May. Uh, around 2019, I then uh, early early 2019, 2019. This is when it was getting hot, like really hot. Met a source on media. Said that the ECC is investigating um, an Angolan donation, which was basically uh, covered up or publicly known as a donation to Angola while the actual fish were written. So, so uh, just to double check, I then asked with another source we are on, on this investigation, fishing quarters. Uh, this person was even more confident that actually investigation it turned out is bad. so advanced that this person told end of the year question was James I was like no way James is too powerful to that was me so so then um, uh, around September 2019 um, uh, yeah, remember, but we, when we got that information that investigation is advanced, I often brief editor to say, okay, these are the stories. Uh, this story. Sometimes it's often just the complication to understand false of some of the key events happening. But uh, by 20, September 2019, uh, we had a, uh, we managed to put together a meeting, Sharon. I, James from the Manes, that first meeting, we were saying, okay, we have this document, and to going to write the story, and then package the story, write on it. Inside, not a published feature, that agree. Al Jazeera in the end, without. So, so after that that meeting, even I mean, at that point we really had already some decided uh, we're not going to wait for Al Jazeera to as that. In fact, this is a story we have, as I've explained now. Worked on decade. So that uh, this uh, we did a story called um, Angola Deal Hijacked. I remember that story very well. It was a uh, yeah, what's that? Uh, I did. A, we did a story on uh, that that deal. I spoke. Uh, that one. I don't know if. Yeah, I, I don't know whether we got good reaction on it because I think at that point it was more of just the usual fishing fish. People didn't really understand. But from that point, we already knew there is a color, the investigation coming up. But we are not going to wait. So so we spoke to some people. I think ACC. Process helped us as well. Quote, yeah. Mr. Noah gave a quote, gave us a quote, something about, you know, there is an investigation around that, but he didn't give us exact Angolan deal. Um, few weeks later, this was an, uh, the Angolan deal was September 2019. Few weeks later, maybe two, there was a story. Then we did a story. At that point, we knew that fish was coming, right? But we still were not involved in it. Um, we did a story called Businesswoman Arrested in Fishing Dispute. Uh, that's 
Sharon who was arrested Friday. I'm not sure. Yeah. So we did that story for Monday. Um, but at that point, really, we knew that uh, its forces at play who are trying to silence her. In, in, I think, of course, we, we knew that um, she was uh, actually in the story, we said something. Uh, she was trying to help a upcoming case that 500 million. So early November, around uh, early November, around 13, uh, 15 hours, I think, 3 o'clock. Uh, and these details, I think some of them are book. So uh, normally, 15 hours, that's off headline time. Especially, uh, in, often we try and um, focus on it later in the next day or the current stories that are going out. But Tangani uh, approached me and no, uh, we uh, the contacted facility give us the document. It was around the same. Like, uh, get the document on Wednesday and so we, we uh, Tangeni facilitated get the document because Al Jazeera at that point decided actually to publish for reasons. Then I teamed up with six from Iceland, Helgi, others from the newspaper. So, so we then uh, agreed that, okay, in fact, but at least what helped us is we had already understanding of it. Uh, covered it for by a decade. What was the main issue? What are the biggest, uh, what could be the big story that Namibians would want to first understand without loading them with so, so a few days before um, publication, I'll just give you this anecdote. Show that uh, sometimes when you are very powerful, you think that you have it all, and sometimes it can just power disappears so fast. It was a weekend, I think, and Esau was. Uh, I asked Esau, um, Mr. Esau, and said, "Comrade, uh, writing a story. Uh, it's about indeed attached, see attached questions." Uh, Esau was. Really confident that actually in nothing wrong. If anything, powering a lot of locals, including his family. But um, uh, he said something like, "No, uh, uh, I've already responded to those questions." Al Jazeera said, "I want to, and you must wait until I come back uh, from activity." I said, "But that will be too late." No, he said, "No, my friend, do what you want to do." Then he sent me photos of him, Corporal. Um, doing the next thing. So mid um, uh, mid November, fish, we published Fish Rot. Uh, that is um, on the 13th or 14th. Um, after that, I think uh, before that, I just want to mention how shall a Jean Catalan, I call her Sweetie Pie. She's often the person in the background who makes sure that the uh, message is clear, avoid errors. You. One of those, uh, I think uh, she not hear about front page. Zeros. Another one is the force. The force. Uh, <laughs> uh, another one is uh, another one is uh, Mr. Nick the force. Mr. Nick the force. Uh, is a teacher and principal by my profession. Uh, I remember the first encounter I had with him. I was still a young reporter, still learning. I wrote a story. He was still not working with us. Um, and then on the website, there is a comment section. He pointed out every single <laughs> grammatical error. And, uh, <laughs> and I think it was a story about the defense ministry. And he pointed out, I think it's novel actually but i think uh, later on we, we work together like right now he's often the person he's a gate gatekeeper names right we have all these other consistent call him a proof so so he's a proofreader often he stays up every day at eight eight o'clock at night make sure that yes have a content 
So, so after the, the fish rod was, the story was published, um, the following week there was a story we read about lawyers because they are the key. Um, I say this because I think that week was elections. Very excited to do, continue doing the stories as they are coming. I mean, just because they're in election, but this is an example of how sometimes when we try and more diligence, we get a better product. So in this case, we, we are doing a story about how money was channeled through. In fact, the first draft was, but I was so excited that this story is coming out on a Friday on election day. But uh, uh, we had a meeting in Tangeni and like, no, Tangeni decided we are not publishing this story. Let's do more, more work. Where are the documents? We are saying uh, 20, 20 million and went through Manje. How do we put it? Uh, okay. Then I we have to go back and get bank records. But then we worked that story for another week. But I think that story was a much more stronger story, much more, in fact, a, a story that will then be central point of the scandal because it shows how law launder money uh, to launder money or to basically facilitate these transactions so so in, in short those are the key key overview of the case up to publication um, uh, in December a few days later we can publish the short tested. Um, I think that's that's mostly it. I hope it how fact that we started way, way back, like right now, probably do a lot of more work, more yard work around oil and all these things. So uh one thing that I wanted to emphasize in um will not have done a lot of these stories or fish rot without source. Uh often the who can be so anyone, but these are people who yeah, are livelihood, because they livelihood, put of society, they think, document, mind doing that. I remember even the, that story, a serious source who their job, but it's mostly about encouraging sources, like sources all cost and uh, the other last point is accountability transparency um, the last thing i want us the media to do is to play a lot of roles i think it's unfair to us the democratic society does in fact too much much power uh, so generally we appreciate the, they are set then they play their role political parties they All in lobbying for for certain done the right way, then we can do actual writing other stuff. But I feel book is more of uh, there is a nice is a nice saying by the founder of Washington Post. It says that journalists are uh, uh, supposed to uh, record perhaps the version of history, but we do record what happened that day so that eight years. Now people archive and say, wow, this and from me. I hope this book provides that, provides a summary of uh, how society should not do. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Shinoveni. I forgot, I always say I forgot to tell the story. Shinoveni didn't trust Al Jazeera with my life. When I had to go and meet them in Cape Town, Shinoveni said, then I'm going with you. Tell them they need to pay for my ticket. <laughs> so he's really, really been a, a lifesaver. Um, this is the moment where Johannes was to do his testimony to talk about his life um, as a whistleblower. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, he can't be here. But maybe if, if, if um, the panel will allow me uh, just to say five things, five minutes, talk a little bit about Johannes. Johannes has become my friend, dear and near. Um, I think, in fact, we, since the very beginning, 2012, Johannes and I were very close. We 
we understand each other very well and, and all of that. And so yesterday I said to a friend, I said, you know, I'm going to attend the, the book, the launch of the book and stuff. And I said, you know, at the end of the day, no, not a lot of us were innocent, obviously, what happened, but it was an event that it's something that happened to us. It was a reality. Our lives changed that day and will never be the same again. And especially for Johannes, who has at many times have to pack up and leave the bag, who has had to deal with poisoning, who has had to deal with, and he remains dedicated. Johann, I live in Namibia, and Johannes knows more about Namibia than I do. He gets the news before I do. He makes sure, have you read this story? Have you done this? Have you, do you protect yourself? You run in the morning, stop running. Where's the taser? Where is the pepper spray? Where, that has become Johannes. And Johannes is so dedicated to wanting to see this through, really for the benefit of the Namibian people. And he says that himself. It's really for the benefit of the Namibian people and the Namibian children. So it's, it's, it's sad um, in a way that he's not here or can't join us to share um, on his own journey and how he is now living his life. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's exceptional that somebody can be that committed under the circumstances that Johannes is living. Johannes's livelihood, as you know it, is completely gone, destroyed. He doesn't work, he doesn't, all he does really is hold Namibia's hand on this journey to Shrod. So it's also fitting when I received a copy of the book that it was dedicated to him um, for the Namibian children. Because I think if we had asked him who to dedicate, he would have said for the Namibian children. He talks about the Namibian people every day, every single day. He talks about them. Even now, as we sit here, he sent a message of the price of protecting corruption, which is um, politicians living well and, 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 and the, just the, the poor living on the other end. And in most cases, Johannes will always draw it back to Namibia, wherever he is in the world. It's about Namibia, and, and you know, he doesn't do a lot of public talking anymore for obvious reasons, but Johannes is, is, I think, without blowing his horn too much, I think he's really one of the best things that's ever happened or for Namibia, and he's still committed to fighting the fight. Johannes says loudly and proudly, he says at the end of this, when he's done with testimony, testifying, he expects to walk around, turn around, walk out of court, and leave with a bullet. He says that is how he sees his life ending, with a bullet in his head, ultimately. And he's comfortable with that. He's resonated. He's made peace with that. So he's just trying daily to stay alive, come and give that testimony, not knowing whether he'll be able to go back home. So that's a little bit I wanted to share about Johannes, um, since that he's not here to talk for himself. And I also don't want to... I give him his flowers every day, but I also don't want to maybe influence how you view him. I would have wanted him to share, and I'm sure the day will come, and maybe in the book, find snippets of who he is and his commitment to um, seeing this fish rot scandal through. But with this said, I think uh, we are going to move on to the next part of the agenda, which is the Q&A. I am going to facilitate the Q&A, but I'm giving you back the microphone to do the summary, and then you can back to me. <laughs> to facilitate the, the Q and A. I haven't prepared to or to do any summary. I just thought let's oh. jump into okay. Q and A session. Okay. Let me open up the floor. There's one from Mr. Job. Maybe just help me with the microphones. Some kind of gene. While he's waiting for the microphone, um, I never met Job, but the morning after Monday, when I went to do my, my appearance, my first appearance in court, uh, Job tweeted, is a corrupt woman arrested? No one is saying anything. She better go to jail. And I thought, wow, <laughs> just <laughs> so I can share it. But yeah, we've come a long way since then. <laughs> yes, Job, it was yeah. yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, just have three things to say. First is, thank you very much, Prof. Friend of mine. Dear Flo. Please come to me. Man, they're going to kill you, man. <laughs> you think you're going to make it? Things like that, but I'm very happy to hear. He struggled a lot with literature. And maybe particularly those of knowledge work. I, I can also just confirm with you. 
that that he's a sociologist. He teaches many modules in sociology, sociology of society. Just discussing, he's going to prescribe the book uh, to his student next year. Um, Sachitende is teaching a module called State in Africa. Approaching that module, organization of the state, which is what Fisherot is, uh, and and Bayat and, and so next year that book will be described in that course. I so module called colonial studies. So I have an opportunity to describe that. So firstly, congratulations and thank you very much. You see, the book is published by UCT. Obviously, the the obvious question is that why not the University yeah. of Namibia? Teach. Yeah, and, and I'm sure Prof have an answer. He wanted to publish a book on, uh, I think, Diamonds of Gold. There was a passage there in his book. You know, he's a very, people think we are radical. We think he's the most radical I've seen. That book, there was a passage that says, speaks about my president, Pai of Botswana, and sex with young girls and things like that in his offices or something like that. You know, I'm simply just decided not to publish it. Fighting, and I think we had to have it shared by the current vice chancellor. Was a PC then he just said no, published the book. So, but Prof never gave up. That book was published outside. To to assist for us to be. It's unfortunate. I'm unable. That's a challenge of a. Congratulations. So number. Um. You know, I was at one point school. And I have a lot of knowledge. Any, always at that time, we were apologetic about nationalism and the importance of our people. So then, every time we release a state, ah, but this nation think uh, is a, just a, an instrument for communism. Now say no, we need to transform the economy. I want to make one concession that I couldn't understand at the time why it against organization of teaching sector. Very clear from Abraham Yambo and the good intentions. That's one concession that I make that you were right to say that we can't have an uncritical support of this Namibianization project. We're right in that sense. But what I still don't agree is that does that mean because some few politicians, maybe you could answer this, some few politicians are able to manipulate the Namibianization project, does that mean that we have to give our bag on it? So I make a concession only to the extent that it's an instrument that has been used Manipulated by the police. I was also very young. What? I was, what, 23, 20 time? Um, yeah. So I'm old now. I have only have 25 years left to pension. <laughs> so, but I think you learn better with the passage of time. But I, I still think that I make that concession. But what do we then do? Do we throw it away and, and see if it's not important anymore? Uh, so I would want to get your views on that. The third and last part touches on you and Chinovene and others also. At one point, you had sent me a text that we must discuss. You want to understand why is it that we settled with Saki, sued me for 500 times. But we never had the time to, to discuss that. But I think there is one thread. 500,000. 500,000, yeah. Yes. So there is something that we make a mistake to understand is that these guys that are in jail, they were once powerful. And when we're talking about powerful, it's not powerful in a lighter sense. You know, when it attempted to speak about it, but they were really powerful in, in, in the classical case. One young lady came, drove all the way from Vaves by to my office at UNAM. And she was telling me about this whole thing and how the Saki is involved, how the, the bosses of the, of the company, and that company is actually not covered in this scandal. Eh? I think it's, what's the... Vaves by that big, big company there. I think the company that uh, Pocolo used to work for, what's it? Pascanova. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. but number. this lady, she was, it was in the process when they were doing this new application. She came to me and she was saying, no, we go to a south farm and that's where the money is delivered and things like that. So I felt that I had enough information. So how the graph was drawn to me, I was convinced that Saki is the most corrupt person. So I went to say it on Peter and everywhere. <laughs> the guy printed it out and he sued me. And my lawyer was saying, no, I just want you to explain to you that this thing, I went to different lawyers and the lawyers advised, no, you need an advocate in this case. But I was saying, this guy is corrupt. We all know about it. And the explanation was that this guy is so powerful. We wrote to Noah to ask him and say, can you please ask, give us the information on this thing that Noah wrote, we still have a letter and said, no, all those Namibia liquid fuel and all those Saki who has been cleared, there is no iota of corruption on him in writing by the Director General of the ACC. Then when, you, when a person see, sue you, there's this process of, um, what do you call it? Mediation, eh? Mediation. No, no, mediation. So, and then Kadira was always telling me that judges are human beings. So we have to be very careful about this case. He was explaining to me that, look, Saki amended the constitution and make a judge president serve as a deputy chief justice. So the changes and transformation in the judiciary has fingers of Saki Shanghala. So in other words, technically there were some favor that judges were also done. That was his view. So we went to mediation. It was a retired judge, Miller, who was uh, presiding over this mediation. Then I went there confident with my lawyer. Saki came with my Randy Clegg, by the way, who was his lawyer. And the mediation started. Saki just started, yeah, this individual, this individual is talking about me. This individual, this individual. And he finished, then it was my turn. I also started, this individual, this in <laughs> I only said it twice. The judge stopped me and said, oh, oh Mr. Mopanda, which individual are you talking about? I said, but he was just calling me an individual. So then my lawyer at that moment asked for a break, went out and he said, this is what I was telling you, tough for us. If the judge in two seconds could hear and allow you to be called an individual, but doesn't allow you to say the same, it tells you, and it also becomes very scary. Something that I have not disclosed publicly is that the reason why that case was settled, not because there was any secret negotiation, it was actually James. Because we were preparing, they picked up that we were preparing that there must now be discovery. They're saying you are not corrupt, you have to clear your accounts and things like that. It was actually James who convinced Saki. <laughs> yeah, that, that you, must, uh, you must also be able to. And I think sometimes what is lost in translation is because these people are now in jail and all these things, is the amount of power. The amount of power. I was telling Shinovene one day, you know, having those debates, because I have a love-hate relationship with this judge. One day you just wake up, he just write nonsense about you. But tomorrow he will call you, hey, comrade, <laughs> what are your sources saying? So, so he was, we were debating and saying, these guys actually had the strategy. They had the two million for my case. You shut up this one who talks a lot. Others were all going to be quiet. Esau, by this time, Esau was going to be vice president of SWAP. Thank you. They had the I budget have to stop for you, it doctor. And, and things like that. So, but, but lastly, these things, uh, people like Sharon and others, and Stephenson, it, they teach us, teach us as one thing, and I think, it's, as I sit down, so something that we have to think about. In law, they call this a state witness and things like that. So usually as activists, she's correct. I mean, <laughs> we are good friends now, but at that moment I was thinking, ah, ah she must be part of the web. But... The mistake we are making is that out of the so-called criminals or people who are associated with cr criminality, one that decides to share information with the public without that person taking that position, we will never know. It is something that all of us must take home and internalize. And at that moment, I'm not saying we must make them heroes, <laughs> but at that moment, the country only have that person who decides to turn on them. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think Tangeni will take about two or three questions and then you can answer. So I think it's Gwen at the back there. Morning, everybody. Morning. And firstly, thanks Tangeni, Shinaveni, Prof, 
I think this is a very important um, addition, I think, to Namibia, uh, bringing out this book. And I'm hoping it's going to really pique the interest, particularly of the youth, in reading again. So let's yeah. hold yeah. thumbs about that. Um, I've really got a comment, but also a question, because I'd like to hear the input of the ca uh, panel on this. And it's been said by Prof and by Shino and Tangeni, um, at the end of the day, what is this all about? Why don't people really care? Has fish rot just piqued the interest because they're big names and people have been in jail, or are people looking at the deeper issues underpin underpinning this corruption? And again, I'm always looking at our society. We talk about fish rot, we will be talking about oil rot, there's no question about that in the future. What about moral rot? The issue we have to deal with among our own people um, who are unhappy about corruption, but is it because they're unhappy about corruption or is it because they feel it's now their turn to eat? And I think this is something we really have to deeply address. Sharon said it and I shook my head when you said it, when you said the youth are standing up and the youth and the youth and the youth, are they really? Are they really standing up and what do they really want? Do they just want to be in the position of the elders and eat what they're eating? We've got wonderful young people out there, don't get me wrong, we've got some incredible young people who I can't wait to see in the corridors of power because I think they'll make a difference. But for the most part, are we not just going to be looking at more of the same just with younger faces? So how do we dig down very deep into Namibian societal values and say, are we for or are we against corruption? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to show by the things we do and we say that we are morally incorruptible? I think this is a big question that lingers and that underpins everything like this. <clears throat> and then just briefly to add on to something that Shinaveni said, the importance of investigative journalism, I cannot overemphasize. And unfortunately, it's something of a dying craft, unless we got support or get support, because everybody knows the media is in deep peril at the moment, around the world, globally, but here in Namibia as well. Why? And here I turn back to the youth. They're not reading newspapers anymore. They're probably not reading all the stories online either for those who would offer a digital future. Mm. They read the first paragraph and then they move on to the next bit of clickbait. So how do we deepen investigative journalism, which is absolutely essential to bringing out the likes of fish rot and the oil rot to be and everything else and speak in the interests of our citizens mm. unless there's public support for that? So again, civil society, the role of civil society combined with the media is absolutely critical to moving us forward as a more honest nation. Maybe I need to say that because that's where we need to aspire to and get to. And again, just briefly, Carola is here. There are a few other people here who've been involved in the Action Coalition, which in 2016 started um, and we tried to engage the Ministry of, of uh, Communication Technology Information um, to get an, uh, a Freedom of Information Act for Namibia. Mm. Exactly. Not purely for the purposes of investigative journalism and facilitating that, although it should and hopefully it will, but really for our people themselves who need access to good information in order to make the best decisions about their lives going forward. And they cannot do that when there is an atmosphere of secrecy. And the profs already said the ministry shut the doors in his face when he tried to get further information. Shinaveni, the likes of our investigative journalists, battle with that sort of secrecy on a daily basis. And you can imagine where the people are kept in the dark, the people are going to make bad decisions and do the wrong things going forward when they make their own political choices. So again, lastly, the importance of the synergy between the media, between building the media, between building the trust back in the media. In the 1980s, when I started the Namibian, the paper would sell out every day. It would sell out. People couldn't 
eat it enough. So I call on basically the public, the youth in particular, guys, support them. You need to support them to keep good journalism alive and take an interest in campaigns around what Action Coalition has been doing, things like we've got this uh, access to information law now, we're pushing the Whistleblower Act to protect whistleblowers and things like that. And don't let this just fall into the vacuum. Um, there are people out there doing stuff to really strengthen our democracy and our commitment to democracy and to keep corruption at bay. So, well done, guys. All the best. Thank you, Greg. We'll take one more from the back there, and then we can, in, the panel can engage us. Can I just ask that we try and keep it a little bit shorter? Um, There's also a question here, a little bit shorter. Sorry, I, I, do, I, I realize now that most of the people in the room know each other. From They come from a similar background. I don't know all the names, so please excuse me <laughs> with that when I do say there's a gentleman and there's a lady um, across the room. So there's a lady. <laughs> in red, the comment or question. Please go ahead, man. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this um, opportunity. I'm called Ina Maria Shikongo. I'm a climate justice activist. And um, I'd like to talk about a lot of things, obviously. Um, accountability and transparency. I mean, even Prof, you mentioned that um, there are people in Parliament that were also involved in fish rot. So now my question is, how come we have some people that are sitting in jail and some that are still in parliament making decisions for us? My question, accountability, again, is this really accountability? No, it's not. Um, so when we look at the people that are sitting in jail, are we looking at the same scenario that happened with the Caprivi case where people were kept in jail for like 15 years and then released a couple of years later because they have to protect the people that are making the decisions. Making decisions on behalf of us, the people, the youth, our environment, and our resources. I mean, we all mentioned the case of oil rot, for example. I mean, some of you know me because we've spoken about this. So um, it is already happening. So please just start your research. I mean, Eureka in Africa, for example, the owner has already sold his shares without even removing one single barrel of oil. So the people that are now sitting in power are literally selling out our resources. They are selling out the future of our people. Why? Accountability again. We are not talking about it. And even if we're talking about democracy, she already faced intimidation. I myself faced intimidation. Uh, our communities have been asked to pay 500, over 500 million to Namco for what? For defending their rights? For defending their land? I am sorry. Democracy, accountability, questionable. So now, who is being protected here? Is it the, com the companies? Or is it the people that are sitting in power? or the partners. So when I look at the companies, I see neocolonialism all over. And why am I saying that? It is because when we look at the shareholdings, most companies, like Rico in Africa, for example, it's 10 to 90%, right? Before dependence, it was five to 95. So that is still the perpetuation of colonialism, whether we like it or not. Okay, and, and the people that are busy pushing for this, they remind me of Mabuto Seseseko. Okay, they are still in parliament today. So, so now, when we talk about accountability, when we talk about accountability, let's hold everyone to account, not only the few that are sitting in jail. That is all I'm saying, especially if you are talking about change within this country. Thank you. Cross and then Jenny and the panel, the rest of the panel, you can. I'm glad I'm not you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you need me to remember, remind you why UCT, organization, um, the moral rot, and the youth. Are they involved? I think that was directed to me. I should perhaps answer that. Investigative journalism and its survival and role in society today, and then the issues of accountability. Okay, I will only um, uh, address the Namibianization issue. Um, 
and re leave the rest to uh, fellow panelists here. Um, Job, the only, um, the, the, the simple way for me to phrase why we criticize BEE, Namibianization, is really because the way it's framed is about enriching people, individuals. So where do you start? If it is, if it is about Namibians, where do you start? We, we give away fish to people for free. Why do we decide that these thousand, two thousand, five thousand people are worthy of giving Namibian fishing rights and quotas for free and not the other 2.6 million? So we, we criticize it because it's, it's always going to be for a selected few. But if you, if you, uh, design a way. People are against the word auction. Sharon and I often debate about this. Sharon and them get fishing rights, get fishing quotas. They still auction them individually to who they want. And you know what happened? They are the same people who come back and donate to a school. Why shouldn't we let this people we entrust with running the state to do this not for individuals, but auction or find a way to get that money into the coffers where that money is then used for the general public. Whereas mostly it will be at least used to take care of the, the needs, the broad needs. Of, of society. So I'm not against empowerment. I'm not against Namibianization as, as an idea. I'm against what, how it is used. It will, it will always, I tell you, go to individuals. So the, the point that Prof made about put the money in a sovereign fund, clear, direct objectives of how that money is going to be used, I would rather we support that than say to people, okay, we've got oil coming. Namibians, apply. You know who will apply? It's the people who have access sure. to those. Who... <laughs> I'm kidding. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. it's, not your, it's not your ordinary Namibian who needs that, that money because firstly, they they just won't know how to fill in that form, never mind where to find it, never mind even hearing that there are applications or there's an announcement for applications. So BEE, Namibianizations are what I call a ruse. It's, it's a scheme. Make us believe that we are getting empowered. That's, that's really my objection to it. Thank you. I, I, I wholeheartedly. I wanted to make a comment about the sexual life of former President Mackay that, that I referred to in a book that refused to be published by the University of the Press. That was, this was in the public domain. Uh, in the, um, uh, Botswana, where I lived before I came here, I had a terrible corruption scandal. Um, and uh, this was all public. This was President Mohai admitted he was <laughs> having sex with young women to be his um, dormitory. Uh, this was not secret. All I did was happen to publish it. Still, crime in, it seems to be a crime with, uh, which refused to publish it. I've published three books on this. Uh, one of them was funded by the Beers, right? Um, but one of them was funded by African Development Bank. The third one, which was the truth, no one would publish. Right? Truth uh, is not profitable. I had to actually self-publish it. 
It's a bit of a shame. See what happens to Diamond. And the truth of it, uh, unfortunately, no, even the none of the press was. Yeah, Namibianization uh, is a scam. Wrong. Us taking this oil money, fisheries money, creating thousands and thousands of jobs and building real homes for a real working class Namibia. Oh, do I have to enrich people who are honorables? Right? No. I honestly believe develop Namibia faster and more significantly. Take this money offshore, fund in a sustainable manner like the Norwegians have, bring only the income from that fund back, has to first and foremost eradicate poverty, which is such a blight on the people. Otherwise, if we follow the course of action of Namibianization, they'll be more honorable to our uh, profiteer off the backs of working. As for me, radical. I'm radical? <laughs> I don't think I'm radical at all. I want a system Poor people get a get a shake, and you're not doing it. I, is that really radical? I don't. I'm not a communist. I <laughs> I just want companies to pay their taxes. Radical. I don't want them by barrel. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, um, I'll stop him. Um, why UCT publish an amibianization has been dealt with? Um, the moral rot of the youth really radical as they should be, not to be. Uh, investigative, it's, it's life, current it's a state of uh, journalism, as well as the issues of accounting. Um. But quite a expensive uh, kind of job daily way. Staff way come back. President will say the same thing. When it's about patience, in a year we often if we get three, four good stories, four investigative stories, then we say, well done. Um, but these sometimes take years and months, and sometimes they don't, they don't, go, they don't, go, they don't even get published. But what I think can be done is, I think from ourselves as, as editors, as journalists, we should be able to encourage or find a way for the public to support us. That we have done well so far, where we know that uh, let's say, um, uh, general, the person can decide, okay, every, every Friday, every month, I'll give you my $5 as my contribution to, to journalism. That either gets deducted every month or you can drop it at the office. But uh, those are um, dynamics that we can work on to ensure that we, but I think overall we should be able to create a reading culture that of young people who are, interested in. I think uh, Toivo tweeted two, year, two, two days ago asking somebody who called in to a program and um, they were asked who the Prime Minister was and they don't know. So that is really a, a reflection of how much more we should do. Um, I wanted to also touch on Recon. I know Maria has, has been a very strong advocate of, uh, of, of, of um, uh, the activities happening in, in, uh, in Kavango. I know, I hope you also appreciate that we have also done a lot of work. Uh, Timo is here, he has done a lot of work on, 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 on Recon to an extent that we, we, we are probably branded as being uh, like uh, uh, some, some form of uh, like we are like. Anti-development. Yeah, anti-development or some addict on, on something. <laughs> yeah. so, so we did to a point where we reported on that Recon story to an extent that we we, we gave the public more information, but you are right, we should be able to work on the finance part and understand the dynamics there. 
but I just give us a bit of time. I'm sure we will get there, but uh, because we have so many things that uh, we need to also tackle. Yeah, I think that's. Um, the, I think that yeah, Mo the youth, moral decay. Yeah, the uh, I think uh, I, I I wanted to just say about this moral decay in in the country. It's it's really gone bad that we each. It looks like just even basic solidarity with with others, especially with the, those who are in need. Even solidarity with others has disappeared in most of our societies, and that points to moral decay. Um, what I find strange is that is how Namibians get worked up that Bible is not taught in schools, but they wouldn't get worked up about ethics or basic uh, love thy fellow human being or animal. Um, that's not even addressed. When when I was uh, uh, um, when I came to Venduk, or when we were in, in school, when we started school sub A, they used to teach us really. This some of you might find demeaning or bad, but we used to be taught how to cross the road. Mm. Like they were, it's a class to be taught: <laughs> walk here, stop, look left. right, left, right again before you cross. Uh, <laughs> we used to be taught just simple things like stand up for the other adults or the disabled to see it. Uh, you would see it in our society. Somebody would drive their car, and this is not just taxis, by the way, park in the, stop in the middle of the road and start chatting. Like, we just don't care about each other, we, about the next person. It's, it looks as if we've, we've, um, misinterpreted what freedom means, what independence means. And I think uh, politicians, please, and academics help us get this into back into society where maybe there are ethics classes just teaching ethics in primary school, in high school. It should start there. You can't wait until university before you start teaching people what is ethics. Then, then we'll, we're lost. So I, on moral decay, I, I can only agree. We, there are just so many simple things that tells us society has gone off the rails completely. Um, I'd like to talk to that on the issue of youth and the moral decay. Um, my view when it comes to youth is that, or any raising any child, children don't do what we say, they do what we show them. So unfortunately, we are expecting a youth that is growing up in a society of, I must also eat, I must also eat to suddenly be different. They, are, they, they, they see it every day. They, they want to be Shinoveni's friend because maybe, you know, he knows somebody somewhere. Because that's how we have taught them that this is how we operate and how things work. But besides that, why I, I said earlier the kids are cleaning up this country, I really believe that th these young ones, they are a lot more radical than even my generation. They are prepared, but we can't arrest them for saying there's no jobs. So the, the things that we should be encouraging the youth to do, we send police to them, heavily armed police for that matter. They, even when they were anything, and these are very young children. The problem lies with us. So we're now looking at them and saying, oh, you know, we were better as kids. But we taught them, we showed them that this is how you do things. We silence you with violence. We silence you, you can't say anything. I can't say anything. I was blacklisted. I was just telling a friend the other day that somebody um, said to me, a very high-ranking politician, oh, which Sharon? That one, the enemy of Namibia. It's, it's, the society is telling me I need to keep quiet. I live in a country where I'm, otherwise I can't eat. I can't feed my little ones. So the youth really, with what they have, the little that they have, I do believe that this new generation, they are a lot more radical than we were. We just need to then, I don't know, do more. 
talk to them more. Do more. Let me uh, come in there just to, yes. to um, support you in that regard. I also believe that there are really no role players. Mm. Yeah, I mean, how shall the youth do better if I call them up there, <laughs> or the leaders of, of the country in general, not, not just in Namibia, are not doing better? Yeah, the young people need role players, someone they can look up. And in, in, in the time of social media, where we just pretend or we just read headlines and that's it, also to get to details and to understand really things and not just pick up something and I, I know everything, yeah? So also the eager to learn about something. And, and here I do would like also to, to emphasize what, what uh, um, Ms. Lister already mentioned, the role of, of journalism is much more, it's also educating, mm. yeah? And, and, and in a way to read really a whole story, not just to pass it between, I don't know, one taxi or, or going to one hill and quickly look, oh yeah, I know. No, really sit down and read the whole content and investigate and do research. Research is so important. And there the academics also come into. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think, but it really needs role plays and moral. That's really something that wake me up. Yeah. This is also something where we can jump in as Konrad Anafan to give give some fundamental basics, ethics, yeah, and, and some understanding about corruption. What, where is corruption really starts with? What is corruption actually? It starts where you already try to manipulate somebody. The policeman maybe, uh, you are uh, involved in an accident, whatever. I myself, I grew up in a country where corruption was, I don't know, was everyday day. Yeah, and from the, yeah, small up to the, yeah, so I'm I'm really aware about this 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 problem, and we have really to wake up our 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 youth yeah about this to know more about corruption where it's uh, because it's also a, an attitude yeah mm -hmm. once it's there it's accepted then it can has and the last thing maybe just to to stop there when it comes to money laundering and so forth it's really difficult uh, because it needs international rules it does not end at Namibian border. Mm -hmm. It needs, as long as there are Cayman Islands and similar <laughs> places, heaven, how you call that, tax heavens tax or savings. similar, it's really, I mean, it's not just in Namibia, it's, it's internationally a, a problem, and uh, yeah, and, and they can use other names, other companies, and so forth. It's really, it, it needs an international effort in order to, to combat that, that maybe for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, there's a lady with a question. Can I, can I just make one, one comment? Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, uh, people, um, when there's nothing left to eat, then people will change their views. Soon there'll be nothing left to eat. Uh, what will you eat when the oil is gone and the fish are gone and there's nothing left anymore? Then they'll get fed up with uh, corruption. But second, let me make one point. Uh, if we wait for the international community, many of whose leaders uh, have bank accounts in, in these secret tax havens, to deal with them, it's never going to happen. I've said to uh, before, there is 30, somewhere between 6, and nobody knows, and 36 trillion US dollars being held globally, all right, in these secret uh, uh, accounts. That's, that's the estimates from the IMF upwards to, to experts who've been dealing with this. We don't have to wait for the international community. I don't believe that. I don't believe Namibia can do it alone, but it can do it with other African countries and say, we must put an end to tax evasion. And the only way to do it is say, if you are transacting with one of these companies located in one of these secrecy jurisdictions, we are going to treat it as though it were income, which is what it is. This is a way of evading taxes, nothing more complicated than that. So then impose a withholding tax. You can't stop it, but at least you can tax it. All right? You can tax those transactions. And we have a sufficiently complex system of uh, anti-money laundering obligations to the central bank that allows a little box on any transaction which says, is this transaction with a passive company in the following jurisdictions? All right, you put that in an annex. And if it is, it immediately should have a tax imposed on it as though it were income, which is what it is. Sorry. I'm no, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. We'll just take three more questions. There was a hand up this side and two hands up that side. Yes, the gentleman. 
Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your great work for that book. I think uh, investigative journalism is saving, excuse me, our asses all over the world. And I think although we might not know it or see it, uh, the world would be worse without it. So thank you so much for that. And um, as a visiting human rights defender from Germany, uh, I mean, you said if there's no fish, there's no petrol, then there is hydrogen. So um, also connecting to your question, I would like to um, ask your opinion on hydro rot, uh, because uh, I had the possibility to join or um, the genocide um, days of remembrance um, of the German genocide against the Overhe River and Nama people in Shark Islands, Luderitz, and the mayor of Luderitz, he said, there is the Green New Deal on hydrogen, so everything will be fine now. And we know that the German minister, Robert Habeck, had been <laughs> to Luderitz and that the south uh, of Namibia is a mining and resourceful uh, place, let's uh, say. And uh, then also you said today that you will teach the book in your decolonial classes, which is great. But I was also feeling a bit uncomfortable when I he heard like today's talk that said uh, that kind of culturalized corruption uh, within Namibia, as if in Germany it wasn't, wasn't a problem. And I know that the German uh, Conservative Party has major problems with corruption. So there is a kind of, uh, yeah. Similarities. Yeah, similarities between. So this was why I would like to ask you your opinion on future hydrogen extraction in Namibia and uh, also, uh, yeah, German Thank companies you. being involved. Thank you. Thank you. There's two more questions on that side, please. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to maybe to make a comment perhaps uh, on the issue of um, moral decay amongst young people. I think the issue, the difference is that uh, when Isaac, them, Gwen and uh, Tangini, them were in exile, they were, yeah, when you're in your time, is that, is, is that you guys had, uh, had some sort of uh, unity of purpose that, that made you Namibian, that no, this is what we believe in. Yeah. And, we'll, uh, and by all costs and means, we'll try and, uh, and, 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 and uh, defend it mm. in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, on issues of moral, ethics, cultural perspective, and also political sense that this is what makes us Namibians, or Namibians, yeah. But now the difference comes in now that as we are progressing, as young people are, as we are growing, at the beginning, yes, when we were probably grade three there in primary school, we also understood that what Namibia is and what Namibia should be and so forth. But now, as we are coming now into, into varsity and now graduating from varsity, but, but the Namibia that I was told and I was proud of is no, no longer exists. Mm -hmm. Then that's why you find Namib young Namibians say that, no, but then what am I fighting for then? Mm. Am I fighting for myself to, to take off my family, which is, which is the most key point? But for me now to go and stand with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Tangeni on the streets, that's where, the, that's where the, the imbalance comes in. So I think the, it's not, the issue of moral decay is, is, is perhaps a, a lack of identity mm. as Namibians. How do we identify ourselves as? Because currently we define ourselves as uh, I'm, uh, I'm Ondonga, I come from Omthia, I'm, uh, I'm from Karasberg, I'm Damara, whatever it is. So, so I think the issue is not moral decay in terms of, uh, in terms of solidarity, but it's an issue of, of identity. That if we are able to say, if I'm, I am Namibian, based, I'm, Nami I'm a Namibian first before anything else, we could have issues where we have more share and standing up saying, look, for the sake of not only my kids, but, the, but, but for the sake of this country that I love so much, that I identify as, I'll stand up and, 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 uh, and become a whistleblower. But, but, I believe that it's not, but I believe that if, for as long as we don't have that identity, Tangeni will go to Namibian every day to write about what he feels should, we should read, and not what the country should read. That's just one my, my, my contribution on the... Issue. Of the moral issue. Yeah. Thank you so much. The gentleman in front of yes, him, sir. I think you had a question. You wanted to say something. I actually had a comment, but okay. Given already spoke about it. Okay. You know, the, regarding this moral decay, 
I think quite some time ago, the first lady of Namibia made a statement. Uh, it's a public statement. It was in the Namibian. Namibians do not care, hate corruption because it's wrong. They hate it, it when they don't eat it. Mm. But uh, Amupanda also read, it, read about it, but nothing he said. I just wonder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, shall I allow the panel to answer the... Qu oh, there's another question here? Okay, take the last question. Um, we're going to have to start wrapping up, I'm sorry. Um, well, but what I'm going to do is we're definitely going to bully them to have a day or a conference or a talk clearly around the issues of um, moral decay and, and saving Namibia, as it were. Yeah, Namibia indeed needs to be saved. My mm. name is Rui, uh, Politics Department, UNAM. Uh, just based on what uh, Ms. Lester said earlier, uh, six years ago, I tried to instill a culture of reading in my classes. So I would say it's compulsive for each and every student to read the newspaper, bring a physical copy with mm -hmm. to class. So uh, there was a fight back from the department to say, no, look, some kids come from previously disadvantaged backgrounds, so you can't compel them to buy the newspaper every day. But I said, okay, at least there should be evidence that they've read. Mm -hmm. So you would have this discussion with the students to say, look, just basic questions like, uh, who's the prime minister? Uh, who's the president? You'll be shocked. There was one student that said, actually, the prime minister of Namibia is Saddam Hussein. <laughs> so so uh, I was actually roped in to the PVC's office because there was a time that I had a high failure rate. And it was not on theoretical issues. It was about current affairs in the country. So this reading culture uh, amongst Namibians, uh, that's why we are intellectually lazy generally. Yeah. There's no natural curiosity about things that are happening around us. Just last week, uh, I brought it to the attention of my colleagues that, I won't mention a name, but a senior colleague walked into my office and said, uh, Rui, we understand that you are airing your views about contemporary affairs, especially politics, but uh, the higher-ups at the university is not happy with your public comments, especially when it comes to the president and SWAPO and government, and that you need to, you need to tone down, you need to be careful. Then I said, okay, what does that mean? Should I start praising them? Get off Twitter. Uh, no, I'm actually not very active on social media. I'm just kidding. So I told this official in no uncertain terms that... Uh, they can go to hell, I will not stop. If it means that I need to lose my job, then so be it. Because I think we all need to take a moral stance and make certain sacrifices if we want to see a certain Namibia. Amen. If it means I'll be unable to feed my family, because we are doing it at great personal risk to ourselves. Uh, we tried to host a public lecture last year on the German genocide. Our, our bosses said, this is not the right time to have debates that are politically sensitive. So there's a great onslaught on academic freedom. Uh, Tangeni, maybe you would like to bring it up with your colleagues. There was actually a story that I wanted to run with you, one of your journalists. Uh, they chickened out, out of the story. So uh, we'll discuss that later. But uh, anyway, that's the nature of the challenges that we are experiencing on a daily basis. So the onslaught, it's not only out there with uh, Namibians that thinking that uh, we are not reading. It starts at the institutions, and most people are actually silent about it. Thank you. Okay, I'll give over to the panel to answer. And um, the, it's essentially, it's two questions around hydrogen <laughs> and uh, the, the concept of Namibia's identity. If I've missed something, feel free to speak to it. Yeah, uh, just on uh, green hydrogen, um, I think it's a bit too early to, to say whether it's contaminated or not. Uh, we often give people the benefit of the doubt with an expectation that they do good for society. Um, but generally, I think my message to Namibians is you should be very skeptical about green hydrogen as a, as a Namibian. Already I can see signs that it's already, it's another, it points to the Namibianization discussion we had earlier on that schemes are brought up specifically to bring a bit of revenue, uh, not a bit, but revenue for a certain group of people. And often they are the same people being recycled from one sector to another. So green hydrogen, I don't think Namibia's elite will even feel pity for it. If anything, they will make sure that they come up, they probably be more creative in the way they'll make money from it. So, so that's really my point on the green hydrogen project, yeah. 
Anybody else? Um, if it's too good to be true, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> what more can you say about Thank you, Prof. Thank um, you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And, and in fact, uh, exactly just to complete the Prof's remark, why would businesses come with, to us, to our country with such great a great, Proposal. Mm. great yeah, proposition. Here is the panacea to your problems. And still, they want, or oh, actually Namibia has already in principle agreed to borrow about 20 billion towards green hydrogen. The Namibian government has signed to borrow 20 billion. I think this was announced, was it in Egypt, mm. concessional loans, we, we, this money is ready. All you need to do is now write your proposals, borrow, your, your magical green hydrogen project will run. So I, I, I think we need to wake up quicker. We need to put measures in place of how our government borrows and how it uses that money. Because as Prof says, it's the precursor source uh, where now we are borrowing based on the money that we will make when oil comes. So by the time that oil comes, there will be no money to fix anything because we've paid for beautiful ideas like green hydrogen. If, this, if businesses believe in green hydrogen, let them pay for that. We are not paying for oil, we are not paying oil companies to give us, I mean, to, to, to get oil out of the ocean. We are not. In fact, the, the only criticism we have maybe is that we, ha we have not put measures in place to make sure that we get uh, the resources from that oil to use it well. But mm. green hydrogen for me at this stage, we must take it with a pinch of salt. Thank you. Yes, um, I think um, I just want to state that the most important thing is to be aware and to have good institutions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, green hydrogen, getting back to that, is a big chance, a big potential, not only for Namibia, maybe for the entire world or the entire continent. But the most important things, at the end of the day, it's about negotiations, about contracts, and about conditions. And uh, yeah, and one has to read also what's written in, on the last pages and to see <laughs> that also Namibia has got its benefit. I think that's about it. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a big chance, a big uh, potential. I do it, see it very optimistic. But yeah, uh, at the end, one has to really look at the conditions. And I hope they, they all be aware that it's going to be also for benefit of Namibia and not just supplying Europe or whoever with uh, energy mm. yeah, but it, it could be it could be a really a something which which helps also the country move forward for development for jobs if it's done correctly and uh, yeah as I said we, we need strong institutions uh, to look at this the, the, the more bigger a project is the more money is involved the more big companies are involved, and they're all looking for their profit, for sure. I mean, that's, that's, their, that's legitimate, okay. yeah? I mean, they, they are the job creators also for tomorrow, so we can't just be negative about it. Uh, but otherwise, business and, 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 and foreign investment will not come into the country, but we have to look at what our benefit is, and this is the most important part of it, and it should be for a country that's that we Yeah, I, th I think there's no contradiction really about... Um, Perhaps green hydrogen will will bring uh, something great to the country, um, but already we seem to have started off on the wrong foot. For instance, how were these companies selected as the preferred ones to drive the project? Why must the Namibian people gamble? by signing on to those loans so fast to do an experimental project. 
So I think we just need to really be critical and 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 that that absolutely to be critical. Thing. I think this this is really really something uh, uh, one have to be clear of. To always to be critical and uh, realistic as well. To be yeah. realistic. That's true. Nothing gonna happen uh, tomorrow or overnight, and not with that expectation. To keep the ex expectation also not that high. That's also That's something. <laughs> Thank you. To keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. I have to really um, start getting us to the end, but I've got doctor for asking for one last chance. You've got two minutes. Yes. But I think, <laughs> I think, I think, you see, we, we, this green hydrogen is particularly making today exist, and particularly the, the, the response that we just received now. Quite a number of our German researchers, the German Parliament is not aware. German government answering to written questions says, no, those are private companies. The government is not involved. But when the German government comes to India, the red carpet is rolled out, everything is happening. The red carpet is rolled out and everything is happening the way it is. So the amount of secrecy with the green hydrogen, why is it that the German government is not telling the truth to the German parliament, for instance, about what is happening with this green hydrogen? We know that in the hyphen agreement, they said 25% until now. They said 25% that we are still not told who is going to have it. That's supposed to be owned by Namibian. Probably the Namibianization aspect. The draft agreement that I personally had released when I got it from the sources, the Germans are saying they are going to draft the, the agreement hyphen wanted to be before it even goes to parliament. So this whole thing is already undermining our institution. So nobody knows who's had, if you ask a question, who's going to have that 20% 20, 20 in this agreement that the Ivan agreement is happening. We already know that some of those elites that are happening, I don't think people have a problem with the future prospects of green hydrogen and what it can do for our economy. We simply just don't want to associate with corruption. We simply just don't want to associate with secrecy. We are just coming from all these things that for all intents and purposes, until now we are still not told. Why is the even Tangeni spoke about the procurement. Why is it that it's not a central procurement that is doing it? Why is a procurement headed by the advisor to the president who's a green hydrogen commissioner mm -hmm. and all those people that are there? And how did their friends, all of a sudden, in a wrong or what, what, what that they were doing, are, are the ones that are getting this deal? So I think the, we are quite very serious when it comes to, to these things. Eh? Uh, I do know, I do respect and appreciate Conrad Stifton and the wonderful work that they've done, particularly for us as an academics. We also are aware the relations to political parties in Germany, both FES and, and CAS. But please don't ruin that re good reputation of, of CAS in terms of the wonderful work that is happening, particularly in these things of green hydrogen. Very, very, very problematic. Rather, we say no comment, but asking us to be positive and all those things when things are secretive, it's just very bad. CAS have done wonderful work. Maybe in the name of democracy, let's agree to disagree. Let's respect each other's opinion. I can respect your opinion. But I think we need to understand the sensitivity of this thing. You have a foreign company that in writing that says, we want to write a law that is going to our parliament that we have elected. That's, that's a fact. We have it there. It, it's, we're very sensitive about these things. Thank you, Job. Just one last comment. OK. I, I actually think this is potentially a wonderful thing but you need to have an independent assessment that's public uh, as to who your partners are and uh, what the terms and conditions are just ask uh, I'm sorry to even say such a thing ask the African Development Bank or the World Bank to, to assess uh, the project for you simple as that and issue a report um, if, if this is a green hydrogen is, is being developed, uh, because I'm currently living in Australia, they're developing massive amounts of green hydrogen projects there. All right, now, could work. I, I don't even, I have no knowledge of this. All I know is that keeping it secret, that's a, that's a, the, the formula is obvious, all right, mm -hmm. and we need, so let's just open it, ask the government to say, okay, give us an independent assessment of, of this project. <laughs> And once you have that, then you can evaluate it. But like that, I, I agree with you entirely. You must be completely skeptical about what, what they're going to do. 
Thank you very much, Prof. Even if you bribe me, I'm not giving anybody another chance to speak. We have come to the end of our proceedings. Thank you very much for choosing to spend your morning with us. It was indeed lovely. Thank you also for not making it obvious that I was extremely nervous um, through this and right through the, pros, the proceedings, I was, I was telling myself in my head, I need to remember to take it up with Tangeni and Shino. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming. And I hope that this project, this book, that you will read it first, because we all have to read, we were told, um, but that you will read it with a hope that you will find something in it that will make you, at least you yourself, want to do something to make Namibia a better place. You know, may, it, may we teach it to our children in our homes, may we teach it to our children at schools, because we need to set, we need a blueprint of what not to do. And this is a perfect example we have been gifted by, by, by the team that's, that's sitting on the panel here. So to the team as well, congratulations. Um, thank you very, very much for your commitment, for your time, and for keeping it alive. Um, I think that the Namibian generally also did a great job in keeping the story alive. Um, my fear was that it would die before elections. Hopefully not, because um, we didn't get it before the elections we were supposed to. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. There are refreshments that will be served. I'm sure the team will guide us. Um, but yeah, let's stay and have a coffee or water. Okay, water and socialize while you purchase your book at the back of the room there for 150 Namibian dollars. And you can gift to your friend, you can buy two and it'll be autographed right now, right here. And that will be the best contribution for your friends. So thank you very much. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you.